today we'll be talking about the physiology of the arterial blood pressure. Our learning objectives is to define and state the normal values of the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, pulse pressure, and mean arterial blood pressure. And then to know the determinants of the arterial blood pressure and what could be the clinical application of today's lecture. Starting with, what do we mean by arterial blood pressure? Arterial blood pressure is the pressure exerted on the arterial wall during the cardiac cycle. And as we all know, the cardiac cycle is formed of systole followed by diastole. So we have a systolic blood pressure and a diastolic blood pressure. What is the systolic blood pressure? Systolic blood pressure is the maximum pressure exerted on the arterial wall during systole. So it's caused by the ventricular contraction. In a normal adult, it ranges between 90 to 140 millimeter mercury, an average of 120 millimeter mercury. Then we have a diastolic blood pressure. What is this diastolic blood pressure? It is the minimum pressure exerted on the arterial wall during the cardiac cycle, during the diastole of the cardiac cycle, and it's caused by the elastic recoil of the aortic blood vessel. In a normal adult, it ranges between 60 to 90 millimeter mercury, an average of 75 to 80 millimeter mercury. If the arterial blood pressure exceeds 140 over 90 millimeter mercury, we call this hypertension. If it is less than 90 over 60 millimeter mercury, it's called hypotension. So knowing that the systolic blood pressure is the maximum pressure exerted on the arterial wall during the systole and it's caused by the ventricular contraction, and knowing that the diastolic blood pressure is the minimal pressure exerted on the arterial wall during the diastole and it's caused by the elastic recoil of the blood vessel, mainly the aortic blood vessel, we have to add to this that we have something called mean arterial blood pressure. What is this mean arterial blood pressure? It's the average pressure in the arterial wall during the cardiac cycle. And knowing that the cardiac cycle duration is 0.8 of a second, and it's not divided equally in the duration of the systole and the diastole, the systole is one third the diastole. So we cannot take an arithmetic mean by getting the systolic value plus the diastolic value divided by two, no. The mean arterial blood pressure equation will equal to diastolic blood pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure. Coming to this, we have to define what is this pulse pressure. The pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, and it ranges between 30 to 60 millimeter mercury, an average of 40 millimeter mercury. What is the importance of the blood pressure? Why do we need to have a blood pressure? Number one, the arterial blood pressure is the main force that maintain a continuous blood flow to the tissue during the systole and during the diastole all the time. Number two, the importance of the blood pressure is this is the pressure that is reflected on the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is one of the important filtrating force which will give us the tissue fluid and facilitate the exchange between the blood and the interstitial fluid. The third importance of the arterial blood pressure is the presence of what is known as diastolic blood pressure. It's very important because diastolic blood pressure is a pressure needed for the normal coronary blood flow that we all know most of the coronary blood flow is done during the diastole because during the systole, the coronary arteries are squeezed by the contraction of the muscle. Also, the diastolic blood pressure is important because it maintains the blood flow to the tissue during the ventricular diastole. What is the equation of the arterial blood pressure? Arterial blood pressure will equal cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. So the cardiac output is the determinant the main determinant for the systolic blood pressure, which is done or caused by the ventricular contraction during the systole. 
the total peripheral resistance is one of the factor or the determine that determine the diastolic blood pressure which is the pressure present or exerted on the arterial wall during the diastole during the relaxation of the ventricle from where we got this diastolic blood pressure we got it from the ability of the blood vessel to recoil back the blood vessel has an elasticity it has the ability to expand accommodating more blood without increase in the blood pressure helping or guarding against the rupture of the blood vessel also it has the ability to recoil back guarding against a severe sudden drop in the arterial blood pressure because earlier we know from the aortic pressure curve in the cardiac cycle that it's the only curve that does not start with the zero all the time we have a minimum pressure which is 80 millimeter mercury now we'll discuss the determinants of the arterial blood pressure what are the determinants of the arterial blood pressure the arterial blood pressure equation equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance so what could affect the arterial blood pressure definitely the cardiac output is one of the important determinants of the arterial blood pressure and we all know that the cardiac output equation equals stroke volume times heart rate so any change in the stroke volume or the heart rate or the factor that affect both will be reflected on the cardiac output thus reflected on the arterial blood pressure also the blood volume which will reflect on the cardiac output and then other factor which is related to the total peripheral resistance factors that affect the total peripheral resistance are the blood vessels diameter blood vessels length the total length of the blood vessel the blood viscosity as well as the elasticity of the blood vessel so instead of just memorizing them you just try the equation cardiac output times total peripheral resistance cardiac output is affected by the stroke volume the heart rate the volume of the blood and the capacitance of the circulation total peripheral resistance is affected by the blood viscosity the length of the blood vessel the diameter of the blood vessel the elasticity of the blood vessel so factor affecting the blood pressure will be cardiac output blood volume total peripheral resistance which is affected by the diameter of the blood vessel the length of the blood vessel the blood viscosity and the elasticity of the blood vessel now let's discuss each one we'll discuss the factor that affect the total peripheral resistance one of the important factors that affect the total peripheral resistance is the arterial diameter which will affect the vascular tone which diameter of which blood vessel the diameter of the arterioles because we all know that the arterioles are the resistant vessels and we took earlier what are the factors that affect the diameter of the blood vessel whether it's a local metabolic factor or extrinsic factor but just to summarize in cases of vasoconstriction which is decrease in the diameter it's accompanied by increase in the total peripheral resistance and increase in the arterial blood pressure what could be the factor that will lead to vasoconstriction and increasing the total peripheral resistance and increasing the arterial blood pressure it could be drop in the carbon dioxide level increase in the oxygen level presence of endothelin or presence of sympathetic stimulation or presence of chemical substance such as the vasopressin angiotensin 2 or in cold situation the diameter may be increased in cases of vasodilation there is increase in the diameter so there is decrease in the total peripheral resistance there is decrease in the arterial blood pressure when can we have this in condition where there is accumulation of carbon dioxide increase in the hydrogen ion concentration in acidosis in presence of nitric oxide in decrease in the oxygen supply 
decrease in the sympathetic stimulation or presence of histamine in allergic condition or if there is elevation of the temperature or in the heat condition. So these are the factors that may affect the diameter of the blood vessel and again which blood vessel the resistance blood vessels the arterioles another important factor that affect the total peripheral resistance is the blood viscosity what is this blood viscosity blood viscosity is the ability of the fluid to resist any change in its shape what are the determinant of the blood viscosity? We said earlier we have cellular component, which is the RBCs, and non-cellular component, which is the plasma protein. So if the blood viscosity increase, the hematocrit value will be increased. What are the conditions that are accompanied by increase in the blood viscosity, either increase in the RBCs number in cases of polycythemia or increase in the plasma proteins, such as increase in some of the immunoglobulins. Any increase in the blood viscosity is accompanied by increase in the total peripheral resistance and there is elevation of the blood pressure, mainly the diastolic blood pressure, and there is increase in the cardiac work. On, on the other hand, if the blood viscosity is decreased, definitely it's accompanied by the hematocrit value is decreased. When can we find this? If the number of RBCs is reduced. So in severe anemia, the total peripheral resistance will decrease because the viscosity is decreased. So the arterial blood pressure will decrease, mainly the diastolic blood pressure. As a compensatory mechanism, the blood velocity will increase, giving us what is known as hyperdynamic circulation, which is an overload on the heart because it's accompanied by increase in the work done by the heart. And in condition where there is persistence untreated anemia, it may be complicated by heart failure. Then another important factor that affect the total peripheral resistance is the length of the blood vessel. Most of the time, the length of the blood vessel is a constant factor. But we discussed earlier that in cases of obesity, there is stretch of the blood vessels, increasing the length. Increasing the length is accompanied by increasing the total peripheral resistance, increasing the arterial blood pressure. All these factors join together in Poisson equation. So, we are discussing the factor affecting the arterial blood pressure. Factor affecting the arterial blood pressure. One of the important factors is the total peripheral resistance. In the total peripheral resistance, we have factors that affect the total peripheral resistance. The diameter of the blood vessel, which blood vessel, the arterioles. And then we discuss what are the factors that affect the diameter of the arteriole, causes vasoconstriction or vasodilatation. And we have to be very careful in this. When we are saying vasoconstriction, it's decrease in the diameter, but it's accompanied by increase in the total peripheral resistance, thus increase in the arterial blood pressure. When we say vasodilatation, it's increase in the diameter accompanied by decrease in the total peripheral resistance and decrease in the arterial blood pressure. Blood viscosity, we said that we have two determinants for the viscosity of the blood, cellular component, the RBCs, and non-cellular component, the plasma protein, increasing the viscosity in polycythemia, it's accompanied by increase in the total peripheral resistance, Decrease of the blood viscosity, such as in anemia, it's, there is decrease in the total peripheral resistance. The length of the blood vessel, although most of the time it's a constant uh, factor, yet it may be increased in cases of obesity. And definitely an increase in the length of the blood vessel is accompanied by increase in the total peripheral resistance and increase in the arterial blood pressure. And one of the important uh, procedures or management of cases of hypertension is to reduce the weight, to reduce the length of the blood vessel and thus the arterial blood pressure. Then the second factor that affect the arterial blood pressure is the elasticity of the arterial wall, mainly the aortic blood vessel and the large vessels. 
the elasticity of the arterial uh, wall act as a guard or a buffer to prevent major changes in the arterial blood pressure. So during the, the systole, the wall has the ability to expand, accommodating more blood with minimal change in the pressure. So it prevents marked increase in the systolic blood pressure. While during the diastole, where the blood is moving away from the blood vessel, the blood vessel won't collapse and give us zero arterial blood pressure because there is an elastic recoil during the diastole that maintain a minimum pressure which is the diastolic blood pressure. In cases of loss of this elasticity, when can we see this? Either in old age or in severe atherosclerosis. It will be accompanied by increase in the arterial blood pressure, mainly in the systolic blood pressure, and there is decrease in the diastolic blood pressure so the pulse pressure, the difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure will be high. And it's very important to assess the pulse pressure in cases of hypertension. Because like this, uh, the blood flow to the tissue will be intermittent. It's done only during the systole due to the sudden drop in the diastolic blood pressure and the increase in the pulse pressure. The third factor that affects the arterial blood pressure is the blood volume and the circulatory capacity. Coming to the blood volume, increasing in the blood volume is accompanied by increase in the cardiac output. And from the equation, any increase in the cardiac output is accompanied by increase in the arterial blood pressure. And as we said earlier, when we are discussing one of the factor, we consider all the other factors are kept constant. When can we see uh, this increase in the blood volume? In cases of excessive IV fluid, there will be an increase in the arterial blood pressure. The opposite is true. If there is decrease in the blood volume, there will be decrease in the cardiac output and decrease in the arterial blood pressure. When can we see this decrease in the blood volume? Either if there is a bleeding, hemorrhage, or if there is dehydration, which will lead to hypovolemic shock and definitely it's accompanied by severe hypotension. Coming to the circulatory capacity, what is this circulatory capacity? The ability of the circulatory system to accommodate the blood. If there is increase in the circulatory capacity, this means dilatation. When can we see this? If there is anaphylactic shock, there is venodilation mainly and excessive capillary dilatation also. This will lead to decrease in the arterial blood pressure. Even though there is no loss of the blood, so coming to the shock, we have different types of shock. Anaphylactic shock where there is vasodilatation. It's done in cases or seen in cases of allergy. And we have hypovolemic shock. One of them is the hemorrhagic shock where there is loss of blood. Again, we're discussing the circulatory capacity. We said it may increase by vasodilatation, mainly in the venous side and the capillary. And this will be accompanied by decrease in the arterial blood pressure, resulting in shock. But sometimes we may have decrease in the circulatory capacity. What do I mean by decrease in the circulatory capacity? There is vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction can be seen either by certain drugs or done during sympathetic activity or the presence of certain hormones. This will lead to vasoconstriction. This vasoconstriction is accompanied by decrease in the circulatory capacity, which is accompanied by increase in the arterial blood pressure. The fourth factor that affect the arterial blood pressure is the cardiac output. Cardiac output affect both the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. But we have to know that the cardiac output equation equals stroke volume times heart rate. If we want to see the effect of the stroke volume or the effect of the heart rate, we will consider that the other factor is kept constant. So 
if there is increase in the stroke volume, it will be accompanied by increase in the systolic blood pressure mainly with minimal change in the diastolic blood pressure. The opposite is true. Decrease in the stroke volume is accompanied by decrease in the arterial blood pressure. What about the heart rate? Increasing in the heart rate is accompanied by increase in the diastolic blood pressure mainly with minimal change in the systolic blood pressure. Why the diastolic blood pressure increase if there is increase in the heart rate? Because increasing the heart rate will decrease the diastolic period where the blood is leaving the aorta and the major blood vessel to the tissue. This means we'll have accumulation of the blood inside the aorta and the blood vessels, major blood vessel. This accumulation is accompanied by increase in the diastolic blood pressure. Kindly please revise the cardiac output lecture. Just to summarize, the cardiac output is affected by the heart rate and the stroke volume. The stroke volume is affected by the end diastolic volume and the starling law, the contractility, all the factors that affect the contractility, the heart rate also we said, and all the factors that affect the heart rate. Kindly revise the cardiac output lecture. Just to summarize what we are talking about, we defined what do we mean by arterial blood pressure, what is systolic blood pressure, what is diastolic blood pressure, what is the mean blood pressure, what is pulse pressure, what is the importance of having an arterial blood pressure, why do we need to have an arterial blood pressure. Then we discuss the factor that affect or determine the arterial blood pressure and the effect of changing any of these factors on the arterial blood pressure. The factors that affect the arterial blood pressure are the cardiac output, the blood volume and the circulatory capacity, the total peripheral resistance and all the factors that affect the total peripheral resistance, including the diameter of the blood vessel, the length of the blood vessel, the viscosity of the blood, and the elasticity of the blood vessel. Knowing the determinant of the arterial blood pressure, We'll know by this the factor that affect the arterial blood pressure and what is the effect of any change in these factors. From this, we will know how we can regulate the arterial blood pressure and knowing how to regulate the arterial blood pressure. From here, we can put a management plan to any change or imbalance in the arterial blood pressure. We can suggest a management plan in cases of hypertension as well as hypotension. So. What could be the clinical application of today's lecture? First of all, we have to think ourselves, sitting together like this, do we have the same arterial blood pressure? The answer definitely no. We have normal physiological variation of the arterial blood pressure. One of the important factors that affect a normal physiological variation of the arterial blood pressure is the age. In the newly born infant, the arterial blood pressure is 80 over 40 millimeter mercury. As we grow and there is increase in the age, there is increase in the arterial blood pressure. So for the adult around the age of 20 years old, the arterial blood pressure is 120 over 80 millimeter mercury. As we grow older, our arterial blood pressure is getting higher. This is due to decrease in the arterial elasticity. So anyone at the age of 60, their arterial blood pressure is 160 over 90 millimeter mercury is not considered hypertensive. Although new studies recommend that even above the 60, with a proper diet and exercise and a healthy lifestyle, some of the individual may maintain an arterial blood pressure of 120 over 80. Another factor that affect the arterial blood pressure and its normal physiological variation is the gender. The arterial blood pressure is slightly higher in the male more than the female. This is before the menopause. After the menopause, the female's blood pressure will be higher. This is due to decrease in the estrogen level. Another factor which affect the normal physiological variation of the arterial blood pressure is the race. The arterial blood pressure is higher in the Western country in comparison to our countries. 
due to multiple factors. It may be genetic factor, maybe the lifestyle, the level of the stress, other environmental factor. There, um, um, they value the time more. Um, time is money. They take life in a stressful way, uh, as well as their diet habit. Most of the time they are eating junk food, so their arterial blood pressure is higher than us. Another normal physiological variation is the diurnal variation. Definitely the arterial blood pressure is the lowest early in the morning. We just woke up, there is no sympathetic stimulation. So the arterial blood pressure definitely is lower in comparison to the midday or even later than this. Another normal physiological variation is the uh, intake of food. So after meal, there is an increase, normal increase in the arterial blood pressure ranges between 5 to 10 millimeter mercury, mainly due in the systole. This is due to the vasodilatation in the splanchnic area. So there is increase in both the venous return and the cardiac output, thus the arterial blood pressure. Another normal physiological variation is our body weight. Um, people who are obese, they will have a high blood pressure of 5 to 10 millimeter mercury, increase in the body weight. Uh, due to the increase in the length of the blood vessel, as we said earlier, and the length of the blood vessel affect the total peripheral resistance. Exercise also is an important normal physiological variation. Usually, there is increase in the systolic blood pressure during the exercise, depending on the severity of the exercise and it may reach even up to 180 millimeter mercury in a stressful exercise. The diastolic blood pressure decrease at the start of the exercise due to accumulation of the metabolic waste product and the vasodilatation of the arterioles, and then it may be returned to the normal or slightly increased as the severity of the exercise increase. Another important factor that affect uh, the arterial blood pressure and its normal physiological variation is the emotion. Any increase in the sympathetic activity is accompanied by increase in the arterial blood pressure. An example of this, the white coat uh, syndrome or the white coat hypertension, people may get nervous and they have an elevated arterial blood pressure if they are assessing or measuring their arterial blood pressure in the uh, hospitals or in a medical uh, condition. Another also important normal physiological variation is the sleep. At the quiet sleep, the arterial blood pressure is decreased, while in the stressful sleep, in the dreams and the nightmares, it's increased. And we will talk about the details of this in next year with the CNS and the mechanism of the sleep. Uh, what are the changes in the arterial blood pressure and the heart rate during the REM and the non-REM part of the uh, sleep cycle? Also an important normal physiological variation of the arterial blood pressure is the temperature, the environmental temperature. In hot weather, the arterial blood pressure is elevated, mainly the systolic uh, blood pressure due to increase in the heart rate. And there is drop in the diastolic blood pressure due to the vasodilatation. Exposure to the cold will produce um, both increase in the systolic and diastolic blood pressure due to the vasoconstriction. Another factor that affects the normal physiological variation of the arterial blood pressure is the respiration. The arterial blood pressure shows rhythmic fluctuation with the respiratory cycle. The respiratory cycle is formed of inspiration followed by expiration. So during the early inspiration, at the start of inspiration, there is decrease in the arterial blood pressure because there is increase in the pulmonary vascular capacity, which means that the blood is shifted to the pulmonary circulation and less in the systemic circulation reflected as decrease in the arterial blood pressure. So there is decrease in the arterial blood pressure during early inspiration. As the inspiration continues and reaches its maximum, maximum descent of the diaphragm, maximum increase in the negative intrathoracic pressure, maximum increase in the suction force, maximum increase in the venous return, cardiac output, arterial blood pressure. So there is increase in the arterial blood pressure during the late inspiration and early expiration. 
By the end of the expiration, there is decrease in the arterial blood pressure due to decrease in the venous return. Another factor that may affect the normal physiological variation is the Valsalfa maneuver. What is this Valsalfa maneuver? Valsalfa maneuver is a forced expiration against the closed glottis. So what happens is that the person flows against the fixed resistance to generate a pressure in the mouth. This pressure in the mouth may reach up to 40 millimeter mercury. What happens to the pressure during this Valsalva maneuver is four changes or four phases. The first phase is the arterial blood pressure will rise due to that the elevated blood pressure that has been created is transmitted to the arteries. Then there is fall in the arterial blood pressure as well as the pulse pressure due to decrease in the um, filling um, mechanism of the heart and decrease in the bumping mechanism which will be reflected on decrease in the arterial blood pressure. Later on the pressure will recover and then it's followed by the third phase where there is drop in the arterial blood pressure as the blood is escaping away from the chest and the abdominal blood vessel. Then phase four, there is overshooting rising of the pressure due to sudden increase or the rush of the blood into the heart, which is bumped out against a constricted circulation. So there is elevation of the arterial blood pressure. These are the four changes in the arterial blood pressure during the Valsalva maneuver and Please note that while there is changes in the arterial blood pressure, there is changes also in the heart rate. So we have one curve for the changes in the mouth pressure, changes in reflected on the arterial blood pressure, as well as the heart rate. Another application of today's lecture is your ability to measure the arterial blood pressure by both the palpatory and the auscultatory method. For the auscultatory method, you know the theoretical background related to it, which is the Krotokov sound. While measuring the arterial blood pressure, be careful where you place the cuff of the sphygmomanometer and the sphygmomanometer itself and the arm of the person in relation to the heart. As we should, They should be in the same level as we take the heart as a reference point. Elevation of one centimeter above the level of the heart is accompanied by decrease in the arterial blood pressure by 0.77 millimeter mercury. One centimeter below the level of the heart is accompanied by increase in the arterial blood pressure by 0.77 millimeter mercury. Don't tell me that it is not even one, it's 0.77 millimeter mercury per centimeter. We're not talking about one centimeter only. It's most of the time it's more than than this, so it may affect the measurement. And in real life, if we take a person that he is 1.8 meter tall, the arterial blood pressure in the cranial arteries would be 55 millimeter mercury, and in the arteries of the soul, it would be near 200 millimeter mercury. Also important to know that the arterial blood pressure may vary according to the site of the measurement. It is also higher in the lower limb more than the upper limb, and it is higher in the used arm more than the other arm. Another clinical application that you should know, when we stand suddenly from a recumbent position, the systolic blood pressure decreases due to the decrease in the venous return and cardiac output, but the diastolic blood pressure may slightly increase due to the reflex vasoconstriction. By this, we finished today's session. It's the first session of the physiology of the arterial blood pressure. I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you.